Well, resurrection exists to make much not of resurrection, but of Christ. The very resurrection of Christ himself exists to make much of him and the resurrection of his followers. This is a day of great hope because, well, resurrection is central to Christianity, to the good news, and to every heart that thinks consistently with reality. Resurrection is a central concept to Christianity. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says this in verse 3. Paul writes, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. It is of first importance, it is of centrality that Christ died for our sins, that his death was marked through burial, but he rose. And in raising from the dead, he manifests himself for all that he is. And he demonstrates full and complete, total acceptance of his sacrifice. Now, you know, a lot of times on this day, Christians rightfully will remind the world and skeptical and doubting hearts of the grand realities of the resurrection, spending much energy to defend the truth of it, the history of it. And I would love to do that. You know, I love science uh, and I would love to talk with you for hours about apologetics, but that's not our purpose here. I did want to just throw out a brief word to remind us and bring our thoughts in. Simply this, the transformation of the disciples is proof positive that Christ rose from the dead. The transformation of these disciples. Why? Because Christianity has rocked this world. It's changed its clock and its calendar. Everything now marches to the beat of this one crucified man. And the reason the likes of 11 men, poor, uneducated, and unimpressive to the world they rocked? I don't think so. I don't think they invented a resurrection. You want to know what Christianity looks like apart from the resurrection? I'll show you. The night he was arrested, one of his disciples betrays him. The leading disciple denies him three times, and all the other disciples scatter. There's Christianity without the resurrection. It would have gone nowhere. Want proof that Christ rose? Just look at the 11 men that he used to rock the world. And you can see this is a testimony that is undeniable. Men would then die and live for this truth. It became consuming. Well, the gospel, the good news, promises resurrection to us. That's, that's how. That's how martyrs would gladly go to the stake and gladly be, be torn in pieces. That's why the disciples were gladly giving their lives and pouring themselves out to make known this crucified Savior. Because he rose, and because they knew in him, they too will rise. You know, it's, death is the greatest enemy of life. And therefore, if you're not afraid of death, you're not afraid of anything else. There's no enemy on this planet who could possibly stop you. <laughs> you can't stop messengers of resurrection. You can't stop them. You have, you have no power over them. All the threat that could ever face them, they laugh. And they say, oh, where is your sting? There's, there's nothing. This is the blessed hope. First Peter 1, Peter himself crucified upside down. He says this in his, in his letter to the Christians who are exiled because of persecution. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to 
a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And the Apostle John, he writes this in 1 John 3, ties it all together and says, because he rose, we too will rise. And all of this drama is truly to be received and celebrated as the love of God. So he writes, uh, see what kind of love the Father has given to us. That's what we ought to think today, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Behold, we are God's children now, right now. And what we will be because of it, what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know, we know that when he appears, We shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. The gospel promises resurrection, life. Life returned from death. Bodily life. Not some spiritual existence. Not some otherly existence, but this same self-same body in a new form. In a glorified form, never to taste corruption again. But resurrection life, it's not found in a creed. It's not found in a ritual. It's not found in religious duty. It is given only in and can only be known from Christ. That's what brings us to John chapter 11. And my burden in this message is for you. That you would glorify God by truly trusting him. That the truth of the resurrection would be more than a a periodic celebration. That it would be more than than a momentary highlight. That it would be more than just an an acceleration or an ascension of feelings that, that will soon dissipate. But my prayer is that whatever it is you bear, whatever it is you are currently carrying, whatever it is you are suffering, whatever it is you will face tomorrow, My prayer is that the undeniable truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ would redefine you. That your distracted and distressed life would be refocused on Christ. John 11 uniquely portrays this very principle. It is all about Christ. The resurrection exists to make much not of the resurrection, but of Christ. Now, the passage we're in is in a full and oh, wonderful, glorious, overflowing context, and I would love to spend weeks explaining it, but for now, we're just going to, you're going to have to come with me, and we're going to jump on a moving train and jump right into a context that is full The passage is designed in this particular segment to reorient our thinking, to refine our theology, to redirect the beating of our hearts. It is designed to refocus our hopes, to rearrange our priorities, to reinterpret our troubles. It is designed to renew our affections for Christ. And to jump right into it, I want to give you three headings upon which we can hang our thoughts of progress in refocusing on Christ. The first is the context of trouble, a deeply troubled heart. We will look at trouble. The second will be the context of truth, the statements of truth, the creed of truth. And then finally, we will land on 
not just the trouble, not just the truth, but finally, we will focus on Christ himself and trusting him. Trouble, truth, trust. Let's start with trouble. We'll notice it right here in the beginning of the passage. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for days. By trouble, I, I'm speaking of misery, life under a curse, life racked with the consequences of sin, life afflicted, people despairing, distress, sorrow, and suffering. That's what I'm thinking when I say trouble. The context here is that you have a family and their hearts are breaking and they are troubled, deeply troubled. And it's, and it's a miniature of life on this planet, you know. It's a miniature of life outside of Eden. It's a miniature of life is suffering the consequences of sin, even if it's not your own sin. It's a miniature of life. And few things, you know, illustrate with more graphic intensity than this. Few things illustrate trouble than the mourning of one you love. Well, now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. And there's a bit of stress here laid on the detail. Uh, there's a Bit of stress on the idea that it's four days. He wants to spell it out. Earlier, he said that Jesus waited two days. And, and we find in verse 39 that there's a, a, a statement. He's been in there four days. And you know the King James, it says, and, and Lord, he stinketh. There's, don't, don't, I mean, putrefaction has already started. Decomposition. This is, this is a hot climate. This is terrible. It's, it, don't, don't disturb a, a four-day-old dead body in a desert land. Now, to be sure, well, why the detail? Why the stress? He found him four days already dead. Why? why, why you, John, why do you want us to know this? Well, to be sure, he, he wants to make it clear to everyone there. He wants to eliminate skepticism, eliminate doubt. He wants to eliminate the possibility that anyone could have an excuse and say, oh, no, he wasn't dead. You know, he was just kind of lingering there, swooning. no. It's clearly Jesus wants to make certain that everyone is, or for everyone to see that, that this Lazarus is, is dead. There was some Jewish custom to this. They said, you know, the, the spirit would hover for three days and after the third day, the spirit would leave. And, and so at that point, you know, this is one aspect wherein he can address them and say, whatever your foolishness belief is, the reality is I've gone beyond, he's dead. But I think there's more to it. And more to it comes from the Jewish culture. The Talmud teaches this, that the fourth day is the height of mourning. Not the first and second, not the third, the fourth. And the, the Spirit wants to direct our attention that this was four days now. And this is when Jesus comes. He comes at the height of trouble. He comes at the height of their mourning. This is a very gripping scene. And you know, every, every one of us must face life's, life's enemy. Everyone. It, yes, I, I, Christ's return aside, the de facto standard in life on this planet under the curse is you will face death. And when death gets a hold of you in thought, when it knocks on your door, when it presses on you, either through others or through your own, through your own failing health, injury, disease, you will see it as a taskmaster, a tyrant, a master that dictates over which you have no power. When death presses, there is no higher service you will answer to, none. Death is a cruel taskmaster, and it de demands mortal fear and a consuming service. I mean, think of it with me. Which one of you, which one of you, will you not drop everything when 
you're dying. Or when someone you love is dying, will you not drop everything? Will you not serve death? And it's cruel command. It has a way of of overriding every other thing you could do. It is that powerful. It is a monster. It's a tyrant. It's a great equalizer. And it's no respecter of persons. And, And throughout the ages, since sin itself entered this world, death has always had this mark. And people have been captive. Right? I mean, this is what Hebrews says very plainly. Through fear of death, we were subject of, to lifelong slavery. The most artistic of the ancient world, the Greeks, Euripides, he, he, he wrote a play to, to address this, this matter of death and its tyranny. Because every people group has, that has ever lived have all known this tyrant and feared him, have been troubled by him. So, uh, Euripides, he he writes this play on, um, in Greek it's Alcestis, but it's usually pronounced in English, Alcestis. Alcestis is is this beautiful queen. She's young. She's married to this great and powerful king. And, well, one day, Thanapos comes uh, and this is death, and he's a monster, and he's strong. And he comes, and he, and he comes into the palace, you see, because you know death. He visits the rich and the poor, the strong and the weak, the wise and the foolish. He's no respecter of persons. This, this, uh, this death comes in, and he, he enters right into the palace, and no, no guard could hold him off and he comes right up next to the king and and he takes a hold of his bride and and she she fears and he swoops her up and he takes her out of the palace and of course uh, the the king he calls upon Apollos and the gods and no one can help and and there's there's great mourning and then there happens to be it happens to be uh, Heracles in Greek or you know him through the Roman god named Hercules, he comes to the palace, just pays a visit there to to the king. And as he walks in, he finds the the whole company greatly distressed, deeply troubled and weeping and grieving. And he says, "What, what is happening here? And the king says, death has taken her. My life, my love. And Heracles or Hercules gets so angry and upset. He runs out of the palace and he tracks down death. And he enters into his chambers. And then he takes a hold of this guy and he wrestles him to the ground and he threatens to kill him if he doesn't let the queen go. So death says, fine. Take the queen. And here comes Hercules with the queen. And the play ends with Hercules standing there before the king. And the queen is there veiled in a white sheet. And as the king sobs, Hercules lifts the veil. And she smiles at him. And of course, there's clapping and there's rejoicing. But here's the deal. Fantasy can only paint dreams. But hope is the stuff of reality. This offers no hope. This is only fantastical dreaming. It illustrates the deep pain of man that everyone faces. And it also echoes and reverberates, oh, the dream that everyone has. If only we could defeat death. If only we could bring our loved ones back from the dead. Well... This is the nature of the troubled heart living in a world of sin. Look at verse 18 with me. Bethany was near Jerusalem. It's funny. You might think he would tell us something about where Jesus just came from because of the distance and the the time it took for him to come. But no, he's more interested in what's going to happen in Jerusalem in a week's time. 
Jerusalem is about two miles off. Verse 19, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Now, the very best that humanity can offer, philosophy or fantasy, religion or ritual, the very best that humanity can offer in our times of greatest trouble is this, commiseration. Commiserate. They come and they commiserate. They can do nothing more. It's, let me simply weep. And I don't, I don't want to uh, in some way cast that as a negative. It's, it's, it's helpful to sometimes just not say a word, but, but weep with those who weep. Christians are called to do this. But, but that's not a solution. That's a forbearing. And if this is the solution, if this is the hope, then there is no hope. That you just can cry? That's all you can do? No, no. There needs to be something more. The Jewish funeral was a, was a fantastic thing. I mean, it was amazing. Something we, we've lost the art of it. They paid people to come and cry for you. This was something that was, uh, that was ordained in their system. Uh, the, the burial took place immediately. You, you didn't delay because of the climate and the, the nature of decomposition in that place. The Jews would take all their furniture in the home, and the home of Martha and Mary was a wealthy home, we know from context, that uh, they were well-known, well-to-do, so they probably had lots of furniture. They took all the furniture, and they had to reverse it. This was practice. All the furniture was reversed. No one used the furniture. It was a great statement of mourning. And the mourner had to sit on the ground in their dwelling or on a low stool, and this is exactly what we see. Not only this, but those who came to mourn with them uh, were not permitted to speak to them unless they initiated. You didn't come to give your advice. You came to weep, and that was it. The Talmud actually says this, three days for weeping and seven days for lamenting, and 30 from cutting the hair and donning pressed clothes. It's a condensed way of saying you have three days of just tears, And then after that, you enter into an intentional, deliberate, and organized period of deep lament. That lasts for seven days, a week's time. And then after that, the rest of the month, you don't bathe, you don't wear shoes, you don't wear dresses, you mourn. Well, what is this? A picture of right here? What is this? They're mourning there. It's two days journey, but or two miles away, and, and, and there's, they're mourning. All the people are here. <laughs> it's a picture of great despair is what it is, of commiseration. It's a miniature summary that marks the final reality of this world under sin. And now listen, we're talking about resurrection today, so the issue is this picture is exactly why Jesus Christ came. He came to this world for this picture. He came to this world for this scene. So it's, it's almost just artistic, artistic to say that when Jesus came to Bethany, this is what he found. Because this is what he came to. He came to misery and trouble and mourning over death. And this is why he came. So he came, he came right into it, head first, directly in verse 20 then. So when Martha, and that's a, oh, that's a fascinating little statement. I'd love to share more about the grammar, but you see, it says they were mourning. So therefore, because of that, now Martha gets up and goes to Jesus. You know what that little so says? This isn't getting me anywhere. Maybe Jesus can. That's what the so says. She gets up and she goes, which wasn't customary. That was, would have been perceived as rude for the host to leave. But she does. She leaves. Mary stays. Don't, don't knock her for that. She's actually, uh, it's very clear. She's in a state of prostration. She's likely on the floor weeping and mourning exactly what she would have known and exercised it from her heart. The picture of misery. Verse 21, Martha says to Jesus, and, and this, is, this is powerful because in, in the Greek, it grabs you a little bit. You know, the tenses, 
It's walking you along just in the normal tense. It's okay, this happened, then this, this happened. And, and here you see Martha, she rushes out and, and the very first thing you don't see her walk, you don't see any motion of her body. What you see is her breaking into the condition of Jesus there, him coming and you, the, the tense is saying, she speaks as though she's, she's, she can't stop it. She speaks to him, she says to him an expression here, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, some say, you know, this is an expression of her faith. And and yes, she is not unbelieving here. But her view of Christ is clouded at the very best. And it's clouded by her experience. Let me just throw a note out, an application for us all to remember, to take to heart and to go out with. Do not interpret God by your experiences in this life. Interpret your experiences in this life by God. When we come to God with our experiences projecting on him, we ask the wrong questions or make the wrong statements. Instead, we ought to Trust him, preview of the end, and reinterpret our experiences through him. Now, she says, Lord, if you had been here. And right then and there, you see, and I don't want to be too critical for her. She demonstrates faithfulness. She does demonstrate a, a seeking of Christ. And she shows a, an understanding and belief of truth. So be very careful. But let us still understand the troubled heart. And this often happens for us too, the best of us. In the moments of our deep distress, we we might become clouded in our thinking. And our heart's distress overwhelms us. And we don't even think straight. I'm not being too critical, but I do want you to see the troubled heart and its nature. Here, what what does she do? She limits Christ. That's what she does. She limits him in time and space, both. She says, Lord, if you had been here, had been time here, space, because you were not here at the right time, obviously you can't do anything. Well, that's that's weak. That's not what today's about. That's not what you should take home. That's not how you should process life under the trouble. Don't say, oh God, where were you? Don't say it. Instead, preach to yourself. Preach to yourself, oh soul, why are you downcast, oh my soul? Hope in God. He's been faithful before. He will be faithful again. And beyond all that we know of his faithfulness, the rock solid truth of resurrection is mine. Well, she limits him in time and space. But not only that, I think there's one other aspect she she commits here. She says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And you know, there's something subtle here. It's called presumption. What if it wasn't his will that he lived? You're assuming, you're presuming, you're projecting on Christ that that it would have been his will to keep him alive, to recover that sickness. And, and, And every one of us is prone to that way of thinking. If if God, you know, if he were here, if he just showed up, he would have done this. Are you so sure? Let me remind you, he's sovereign and he doesn't need space. And, and, and time lo, lo, you know, restrictions to do his work. And therefore his will is done. If you were here, you would have, you would have done this. He wouldn't have, he wouldn't have died. That's a bit presumptuous. And after all, let's think logically. Let's think logically. So Christ 
prevents the death of Lazarus in the, if he were there. Let's just assume with Martha. Okay, so Jesus got there in time. He, he re- helped him to heal from whatever illness he had, and he didn't die. What ultimate accomplishment was that? None. Because he's going to die again. Instead, there's something greater here. And so in the likeness of all trouble that we ought to be thinking. God is doing something. He's intending something. He's working something. And so it is here. Now, look at what she says in verse 22. But, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And it's almost a, you know, almost a backpedaling. There's almost a, a recovery of sorts. You know, she kind of comes out pretty boldly. Lord, if you were here, this would have happened. I don't think she's rebuking. I think she's just broken. And I think her troubled heart is just expressing her disappointment and, and her desire that, that Christ would have prevented this. And in that expression, it's as though she awakens to the idea of who is she speaking to? And she says, oh, but, but I do know. I do know you are the Christ, and whatever you ask, God will do. And we all act like that sometimes. We vent, we keep ourselves focused on our situations, on our circumstances, and we vent, and then we we give platitudes, yes, but I know you're sovereign. I know your will will be done. And we find no comfort. Our troubled heart still bleeds. And that's what you have here. That's what you have here. In fact, when she says, I know, I know that whatever you ask, that whatever is in the plural, which doesn't, which means this, she's not thinking what you might be thinking. Oh, she's saying, Jesus, if you just ask the father right now, you can raise Lazarus from the dead. She's not thinking that. Because if you dropped your eyes to verse 39, you would see when Jesus actually makes the suggestion, why don't you remove the stone from Lazarus' tomb? Martha's the one that says, no, don't remove the stone. He's dead four days. Are you kidding? This isn't isn't gonna go well. So she's not thinking, maybe you could just ask to raise him from the dead. That's not what she's thinking. This is, this is a generic statement. It's a generic uh, platitude, an acknowledgement, a, a sense of, okay, I respect, I, I know who you are. I, I, yes, I know you can ask. And, but notice where she puts the accent, right? The accent. That you can ask as though you're a servant of the Most High and, and only a servant. That you can ask. You're closer to God than I am. Hmm. Well, this is an if-only troubled heart. And you know what it's like, do you? Do you? Any of you? (laughs) With me, you know what that's like, the the if-only troubled heart. All too often we live in an if-only mentality. If, If only I had done this, or if only I did not do that, or if, if only he or she did this, or if only they didn't do that. And, and all these questions we, we ask are, and we, we truly engage in a miserable cycle of thought. If only, if only, if only, if only I said, if only I spent more time, if only... All of these are the infamous trademarks of regret. If only we did, if only, and and they lead then to resentment, they lead to bitterness, they they lead to despair. And you know nothing forces an if-only mentality more than death. Nothing. It is the most final of all earthly troubles. And it is the most irreversible of all human experiences. This is the troubled heart. Now, John Newton, the writer of Amazing Grace, he he drafted a line that blessed my soul. He said, blessed be God. The gospel reveals a relief and remedy fully adapted to the complicated misery in which sin has involved us. 
Blessed be God. The resurrection of Christ remedies the complicated misery sin has involved us. Well, that's the troubled heart, and now we move into the truth. Let's look at the truth together, this dimension of truth in the troubled experience. And when I say truth, I'm talking orthodoxy, I'm talking sound doctrine, right theology, I'm talking knowledge of truth, I'm talking knowledge of your Bibles. Let's remember where we are. We are a in a scene filled with the deepest kind of pain and the most dreadful hopelessness. And this is a place where creeds scarcely comfort. Cicero, the great Roman statesman and historian, he, he lost his precious daughter, Tulia, and she was dear to him. He's not a Christian. And he was absolutely altered in his life with the loss of his young daughter. Altered. It, it, it changed the man. And his close friend Atticus, he writes back and forth some letters, and we have them preserved. And when he writes... Cicero says this, I have lost the one thing that bound me to life. This precious girl I loved. And Atticus, of course, does his best to, to write in response with deep sympathy and care. And, and he, he actually asks Cicero, can, can I come and can I try to console you? <laughs> and Cicero responds, he, he says, I read everything the Greek philosophers have written about death. I have read everything they have offered to help overcome grief. And then he says these words, and I quote, but my sorrow defeats all consolation. This is where we are. We're in a place of, of deepest pain and dreadful sorrow. Look at verse 23. Jesus said to her, so we've heard Martha, and in the tense of the verb, Jesus speaks actively, forcefully. He speaks as though bursting new life in his voice. He says, your brother will rise again. He does not respond to her points. He makes no mention about uh, if he were there or if he asks the father. He makes no statement, but simply, your brother will rise again. Now, when he says this, he refers to a person's dead body being raised to standing life again. And sometimes we don't marvel about that enough, right? You've heard it too much. You should be falling off your chairs. We're talking about a dead man being raised to life again. Dead lungs breathing oxygen again, processing a dead heart beginning to pump and a dead bone marrow producing blood cells. Dead eyes opening and receiving optical energy yet again and processing through a dead brain. This is amazing. Just matter of fact, he will rise again. You will see him in his self-same body living. This is remarkable. Now, it reminds me of a story of a pastor who, who went to uh, a, a beloved elderly woman at her deathbed, and after she died, um, family was there and some friends, uh, not many of which were believers, and, and uh, the pastor explained, well, 
we will see her again. And one of the well-intending friends said, oh, that's a nice thought. That's a nice thought. Isn't that true? You know what's sad? I expect that from the world. But what's sad is when Christians practically live that way. They might say they believe it, but in practice, in practice, they don't. They don't. They actually think, oh, that's a nice thought, if only. Well, here Martha actually goes beyond. She goes beyond the idea of a nice thought, and she actually has orthodox sound doctrine. She actually has truth. She's got a troubled heart, but she's got truth. She's got truth. Look at verse 24. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And here the tense again is almost interruptive. It's almost as if as Jesus is talking, she busts in there. No, no, I know that, Jesus. I know. I know. Sounds like Cicero. I've read it. I've read about it. I know all that has been said on this. And it it doesn't console me. I know the truth. It's an anxious response. She says, I I know, but it's a common consolation. He's going to rise at the last day. You notice that on the last day. How many Christians, you know, in the moments of trouble, it's like that for you. You, you. you bear the moments of trouble, the intensity of the pain, the suffering, the affliction, the uncertainty, the, the, the nausea in the gut, the, the, the sense you can't go on. And, and, and yet you will say, I know in the end. But, beloved and friends, this is my heart cry. Don't you see the disconnect? The point here is she's not consoled because the truth, the truth was cold and abstract and out there, written down, proposition statements. It wasn't real and tangible. It didn't live in her veins. It didn't transform and reorder and refocus her present experience. So the circumstance overwhelmed her, and, 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 and she says, oh, I know about that. I know that he's going to rise at the end. But her tears continue to pour. Well, it's also interesting that John has very systematically given us uh, four prior statements about resurrection up to this point in the gospel, and every single one, it was a resurrection on the last day. Hmm, you think that might have some import? 639, 40, 44, and 54 all speak of resurrection on the last day. But here, it's out of the mouth of Martha versus Jesus. So she's echoing his own theology. She's saying, I know, I know, I know, and I have good theology, but I'm hurting right now. And that good theology doesn't quite connect. It doesn't change how I feel. Are you with me? I'm, 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 I wish I could just you know, get an IV and plug it in, download this to you. you. You've got to see the intensity. This is how we all are. Good theology, I got it, but... Uh, I mean, have you ever experienced anything like this? You know, anything like this, where the pain is so great that our creed is powerless to comfort? You know, we sometimes treat God's promises like like heirlooms. You know, real, valuable, expensive Heirlooms. We, we sometimes treat God's promises like that because this is how it works. We believe they have real value, but practically we get nothing from them today. Just an heirloom in the attic. I know it's valuable. It has something to do with my heritage and it's valuable, but you know, it gives me nothing right now. So here I am straining to penetrate and say, don't. 
You see, the troubled heart, the truth, don't process the resurrection that way. One last word on this idea of truth. In order to believe the truth, you must unbelieve all that counters it. In order to believe the truth, you must unbelieve all that counters it. And what am I not talking about? I'm not talking about apologetics and academic statements. I'm talking about the voice of your feelings, the voice of your experience, the voice of friends, the voice of Hollywood, the voice of this world. Unbelieve it all. Unbelieve it all. Just unravel your faith in those statements about the finality of death. Unravel your faith in your experience about the certainty and that finality of death and believe the truth in a way that reinterprets it all. Here's our final point. We've looked at the troubled heart. We've seen the truth in that troubled heart, and there's no consolation. Now, the whole purpose of the sermon. Now, the point of our celebration. Now, how a Christian ought to walk away in the thought of resurrection. Now, let's look at trust. And when I say trust, I'm speaking of personal faith in a human divine being in God himself in human flesh. I'm talking about hope and reliance, dependence. I'm talking about trust. Look at verse 25. Jesus said to her, and now it's, it's as though he made a broad statement that encompasses all the point. It's as though the tense in the drama of the film slows down and camps on these words and lets them reverberate. Jesus said to her with authority and finality, I am the resurrection and the life. Oh, this is too good to be true. It's too great for me to contain. This is the point. He did not say, I teach resurrection. You learned it from me. He did not say that I give resurrection. That's what I do. He did not say that I will resurrect. He said, I am. He did not say, I was or I will be. He said, I am. He stands in a microcosm of deep trouble and grief, of death and curse. And he says, I am resurrection and life. I am. He points then to himself. He turns her thoughts to him. He redirects her whole life. He refocuses her distress. And he says, it's not the creed that you go to for the comfort. It's me. When a creed fails to comfort, turn to Christ. It's Christ in and of himself. He draws from her brokenness to himself. Because it's not, it's not a doctrine to believe that the resurrection is celebrated. It's a person to trust. It is glorious and beautiful. It's a relationship that is initiated, that is secured by this Christ. It is built on the greatest sacrifice conceivable and the deepest love imaginable. The difference we have here between Christ and creed, between I know the truth, but I'm still not consoled, and I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way and the truth and the life. I am. The difference between the creed and the Christ is like the difference between a medical book and the physician. It's like the difference between a cookbook and the chef. We can all go to cookbooks and try. And that's what religion does. He shows up and he says, I am the one. I'm the one. And in fact, I'll do it for you because I'm the one. I'll cook the meal of life because I'm the one. I will heal and I will give life. 
Because I'm the one, I'm the source, I'm the fountain, I'm the power. I'm, I am the fountain of it all. I'm not just an offer to drink. I'm the fountain of water. This is who he is. This is a fantastic thing he does. So when we face death, you know what we want? We want a living Christ, not a simple creed. We, we, we want we want. Christ, person, life, personhood, love. That's what we want. Personal. Nobody has it. Tell the world, nobody has hope here. They have ideas, they have philosophies, they try to they try to deceive you into trusting them and their little thoughts. Nobody has an I am the resurrection and the life. Nobody has in human flesh the hope of the world. This is, this is, okay, are you with me? This is amazing. It should be totally, completely thrilling to our hearts. You know, and this idea of I am, it's just like when he fed the multitude. If I took you back in John, you would see near the beginning of John 6. You know what he does? He feeds, he feeds Multitudes of people, thousands of them. And, 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 and they, they ate out of just a few loaves and fish, and, and they ate. Miracle. And you know what he says at the end of John 6? They come to him and they say, well, we want more. And he says, no, 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 no. Here's the deal. I am the bread of life. So the little instances I do, like a miracle to break bread and feed you when you're hungry and you have nothing, Well, that's just a little parable to point you to me, that you would trust in me. It's all about Christ. I am the bread. Don't go after this. And so when he raises Lazarus from this grave, that's not the end of the point. That's not what it's all for. It's like the bread that he broke. No, no, no. That's not going to last. Lazarus too will die again. What's the point then? The point is it points to me that you would see the power that I have. You would see my fountain burst that I am resurrection and life. That you would see who I am because this is the all important thing. Beloved and friends, don't walk out of this room without knowing with certainty Jesus, who he is, is the all important thing. You trusting him is everything in your life. Everything. It's not the little things he can do here as tastes or examples or parables. It's not the miracles here in the Bible. It's who he is. It all points to him. And he's ever present, ever within reach, ever accessible. Life for your eternal soul. I had more of a sermon to give, but I must rush to the end and say, like Ryle, it is our slight and imperfect knowledge of Christ that is the true reason of our discomfort in this life. If we were truly overwhelmed by who he is, we too, we too would live in a life that none else could explain, in a life that would show trust beyond all experience and all voices. If Christ is life, one reformer said, he is certainly equal to God the Father, for he also is the source of all life. John started his gospel in verse four, in him was life. And in 526, the son also has life in himself. Because of that, he gives to all. J.I. Packer said it well. It is not strange that Christ, the author of life, should raise, arise from the dead. If he was truly God the son, it is much more startling that he should die than that he should rise. He's life. You can't stop him. Well... Beloved and friends, my prayer is that you see this connection and you make the connection in the idea of your own life. 
Steve Jobs, not too far from here, not too many years ago, spoke at a commencement uh, graduation at Stanford University. And as he spoke eloquently about goals of life and how to live, he said, no one wants to die. That's what Steve Jobs said. No one wants to die. Even people who want to go to heaven don't want to get there by death. And yet, death is the destination we all share. No one has ever escaped it. You're wrong. Christ escaped it. Christ greater than Hercules, for he didn't only wrestle death, he killed death. He defeated death, and he rose from the dead, and he led a captive free. Christ is the answer. Christ is our hope. With that in mind, uh, Please remember, wherever you are and whatever you feel, whatever pain, whatever suffering, even death, and yes, even the evil itself, my prayer is that you trust Christ, that you trust the one who suffered the greatest evil, that you trust the one who suffered the greatest death, that you trust him who was perfect and yet took on all of the consequences we created. That you trust him who says, I do this in love for you. That you trust him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Spurgeon said, upon a life I did not live, and upon a death I did not die, I risk my whole eternity on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. My prayer is that you and I would as well. You see, because we live in a land of the dying. <laughs> but here's the deal. In Christ, you and I are on a journey. And our journey is not to a sunset, but a sunrise. The resurrection exists to make much, not of the resurrection, but of this Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the grace you've shown us in Christ. Grant to us hearts that rejoice and sing with fullness of joy. And praise to your name. I thank you for the lyrics that we have been able to sing already today. I thank you for the, the thoughts we've been able to meditate on. And my prayer is that you, you, you weld these to our hearts in such a way that our trust in Jesus would break through trouble and break through where creeds do not comfort, that Christ would be our joy and life. To the praise of his glorious name, amen.